All right. Good morning, everyone. Uh, today is Thursday, December 10th. My name is Myrna Molina, and I am honored to chair today's Judicial and Public Safety Committee. Um, if I can have our secretary, please call the roll. Brown. Here. Gums. on the feedback. Here. It's a nice playback. Huh? <laughs> Leonard. Here. Sanchez. Here. Shepro. Davis. Thank you. You have a quorum. This meeting could take twice as long. <laughs> Those jokes are so funny, they play them twice. Playback from that. All right, I think we're uh, ready to begin. Let's just give it a second to see if we get the same uh, feedback. So give it about 10 seconds and then we'll be ready to go. Everyone that's online, can you still hear us? Yes, I can hear you. Yeah. Okay, I think we're yeah. ready. All right, thank you everyone. Okay, so uh, next item on the agenda is approval of minutes. If I can please have a motion and a second. Move by Mr. Leonard, second by Mr. Brown. Um, please call the roll. Brown. Yes. Gooms. Gums. Yes. Yes. Leonard. Yes. Sanchez. Yes. Shepro. Davis. Mr. Davis. Okay. Um, um, do we have anybody signed up for public comment? No. Okay, uh, next item on the agenda would be the monthly financial reports. Erica, good morning. Good morning. The finance reports for uh, November are included in your agenda packet for review. For the general fund, the coroner's office um, is over budget in the salaries and wage category, commodities and contractual services. A budget adjustment resolution will need to be brought forward uh, next month to rectify that overage. Um, and if you recall, um, I believe the coroner brought a budget adjustment a few months ago and it was postponed just to make sure that we have um, all the final figures in. So I have reached out to the coroner's office to assist them in getting um, that budget adjustment for uh, next month's committee. So you'll see that um, at this committee next month. You may have noticed that uh, our reports in this committee and the other committees uh, this month are listed as drafts. The reason for that is that November is the last month of the fiscal year for the county, and we're currently in the process of closing uh, the fiscal year 20. 
Um, we are also going to begin our uh, annual outside audit the week of January 18th, and that'll be going through to uh, the end of March. So <laughs> we're, um, we are working on uh, closing out the year. And once uh, that is closed, you will get a report uh, about the final figures for the whole fiscal year 20. Wonderful. I'm happy to answer any questions you may have regarding our reports. No questions. Thank you, Erica. Thanks so much. Okay, um, before we begin with the rest of the agenda, I just want to make um, a note that um, under item 7B, um, that's going to be reported under court services. So I'm going to go in a different order, if that's okay with everybody. Okay, um, next item on the agenda is our state's attorney. Welcome. Thank you. Thank you. So I don't have a lot to report today because I'm on my eighth official day as state's attorney, but I did want to kind of talk about the plans for the office and a plan to come discuss with all of you the needs of the state's attorney. So while I've only been here for eight actual days, I worked in this office from 2005 to 2015. I've worked with many of the prosecutors that are still in the office and I'm getting to know the newer prosecutors and support staff. During my campaign, I actually either attended this meeting in person or I watched it online to learn about the requests that were being made. State's Attorney Joe McMahon had created a fantastic office with really great prosecutors and support staff who are all dedicated to the mission of safety for our county. One of the things that he did on a regular basis is he talked about the need that we have in this office. We have a lot of great prosecutors and support staff who are not there for the money. They're not there for the long working hours, they're there for the mission. But unfortunately, over the years since I left, we have lost a lot of fantastic prosecutors and support staff because they couldn't continue to work for the disparate pay in comparison to other counties, along with the long hours that most of these prosecutors and support staff put in. I have seen people there early. I've seen people there late. I've seen people come in on the weekends and I have seen them responding to emails and telephone calls at all hours of the day. We, you should have already received an annual report uh, via email. And if anybody hasn't, I did bring some physical copies. What you're going to see is that this report is up just through the end of October. We're gonna update this through the end of December when we have the numbers. While we have seen a slight decrease in felony cases, we believe that that's attributed mostly to the pandemic and the fact that we were shut down for a couple of months. Much like the rest of the country, we were starting to see a trend upwards in regards to our felony cases. For our misdemeanor cases, we're about the same number that we were last year, but again, believe that to be low because of what has happened in regards to the pandemic. However, the work for these cases has doubled, and that's doubled because of the increase in technology. Our prosecutors have an ethical duty to review every piece of evidence that we have, and that includes the body cam footage. Multiple officers will respond to a scene, and Sheriff Hain can attest to that. And if mo those officers all have body cams, all of that footage needs to be viewed, and that can be into the hundreds of hours. Squad cameras are also have the technology where we're viewing that as well. And again, if you have multiple cars, multiple officers, this is hundreds of hours that have to be reviewed. In addition to that, there's technology within the jail where telephone calls are recorded. Some of the video meetings between defendants and people who come to the jail recorded, and they have technology with their uh, tablets where there are text messages and emails that all have to be reviewed that are, again, can get into the tens of thousands. Sheriff Hain and I are working in regards to that, and thankfully he's been fantastically responsive in regards to being able to monitor what is happening with those so that we're not negatively affecting any of these cases. And while our numbers appear to be lower, our workload has increased significantly. In the next couple of months, I'm going to hopefully meet with all of you and I'm gonna come with specific case examples and I'm gonna come with statistics and I'm gonna come with the actual experiences of our prosecutors and our support staff to talk about how we need to change our budget. I understand that I'm asking this during a pandemic. I also understand that I'm asking this in my first official meeting here. 
but the need is great and we wanna make sure to do justice in our, in our county. In addition to that, our abuse and neglect cases. These are the cases where DCFS or the police find that children are being abused or neglected and cases are filed by our office for their safety. Sometimes that's intervening and taking the children away. Sometimes it's working with families to make sure that they get proper services. Since the, since at the end of October, our abuse and neglect case filings has increased by 82%. That is a significant increase. And I want that to be understood that that's when a lot of kids are not even in school. So our normal mandated reporters, the ones who see all of this, aren't even having that ability to have in-person contact. These abuse and neglect cases are complicated because there's thousands of pages of discovery, medical records, expert testimony, investigative reports. I have already had to move somebody over from our criminal division as a prosecutor and a paralegal to the abuse and neglect department because we were not able to fully staff these cases in the way that we should. So in order to protect the children in this department, I've had to decrease what we have in our criminal division where they're already overwhelmed. And that is just portions of the criminal division. Our civil division, who frankly are the unsung heroes of that office, have worked countless hours dealing with all of the lawsuits in Kane County, representing all the elected officials and dealing with all of the COVID matters that we have had. They have been working tirelessly in regards to the governor's emergency orders. It's because the burden of enforcing has then been placed on the county. Essentially, I can go on for hours. I am an attorney, I can talk forever but I have actual cases and examples. And I know State's Attorney McMahon did this for the entire 10 years that he was here. I look forward to meeting with every one of you, but I want you to know that we are going to work hard at our job to make sure we're doing what's right, but we need to bring people to this office. I'm already seeking somebody to come in to be a grant writer because we are not a revenue generating office. That's not our job. But we're going to bring in a grant writer to hopefully bring in grants to have different programs. Programs that will allow our criminal justice system to look at an individual with addiction issues or mental health issues or a lack of resources in a different way than we've traditionally been able to do so. And we're gonna work hard at bringing in those programs to make sure that we're making a difference. However, we cannot effectively run this office without the support of all of you and without a budget that we can actually look under to have dedicated prosecutors, support staff, investigators, paralegals, to make sure that we're doing justice. I welcome any questions that you may have. I look forward to meeting with all of you. We are here to assist you in any way that we can, but I'm really looking for the support from the county board for the state's attorney's office so that we can do the justice that we need. Thank you. Thank you, and I think I, I, I'll speak I hopefully for everyone on this committee is that we take that task on. We're here because we are committed to making sure all of our citizens have due process and are protected. So um, thank you. And does anybody else have any questions or any comments for our state's attorney? I'm saying that. Okay, thank you very thank much. Thank you. Okay, uh, next item is our sheriff. Um, sheriff Hain, thank you, welcome. Yes, of course, good morning. I wanna say welcome to all the new committee members. Uh, this is a really exciting collaborative group uh, that works together very well in this uh, in this room. So glad to have you with us. Special thanks to Mr. Leonard for his service over the last two years as our chairperson. And welcome to you, Ms. Valina, because uh, I've worked with you for a few years now, and uh, I know that uh, you'll take charge of this very well. So, uh, Jamie, you need to develop a PowerPoint, okay? Everybody on the committee loves that. Ron, I am going to destroy your PowerPoint next meeting. <laughs> and Lisa is rolling her eyes behind you. More PowerPoints, great. <laughs> I'm just waiting for Blair to pull mine up. It's been a very busy month, as always, at the Sheriff's Office with all of our moving parts. So unfortunately, is it stalling on you, Blair? Uh, yeah, I think you have control. Give it a shot. No? Should be up on the screen, right? I can always just go verbal to not hold up the meeting. Go 
clicker doesn't seem to be working. Give the clicker a shot. No. You know what you got to do? You got to turn it on. Let me try it now. No, it's no. not going. Well, that's fine. I'll just nod at you if you're okay with that. No, that's what he's hooked to. And it's sharing, it's watching the screen. So, um, yeah, just tell me when. Okay, you're on. we're good to go to the next slide. So we do have four major projects, I should say three major projects underway at the Sheriff's Office. We continue to develop our new uh, radio system upgrade, very exciting for us and uh, all of our 16 other municipal police partners that uh, and, and fire districts that are dispatched by KCOM. I know Michelle is gonna touch on that, but uh, her and I are working at about a 500 foot level on that uh, project that's gonna benefit uh, a large majority of Kane County. Uh, we're all familiar with our body camera program that uh, we passed through resolution in mid uh, 2020. We are in the process of upfitting all of our cars and our, our deputies with those body camera systems. It's integrated between a dash camera system in the car and of course the body camera system that the deputies wear. We currently have 15, oh, I'm sorry, 16 deputies certified and out with body cameras and the new dash cam system. And they're, they're turning over about a car a day out of our fleet garage to get this up to speed. And uh, the new multi-use facility is flying right along and our, our agency is uh, participating in weekly conversations to make sure that it finishes off properly. Blair, we're good to go to the next one. You can flip all the way through the components up there. So unfortunately we do have our second uh, COVID outbreak. I call it a contained outbreak within the county jail. Uh, we are up to 25 positives amongst our detainees. Uh, we learned through our first go round and with great help from the health department, how to continue the testing on a weekly basis, quarantine people, classify people, and knock this out within three to four weeks. So that's what we were able to do last time. We're very confident that we have enough space, enough staff, and uh, enough testing kits to, to monitor the spread and eliminate this in, in short order like we did last time. Fortunately, there are no serious symptoms much like we experienced back in August with our, our first outbreak. And you see our corrections officers, a lot of people, uh, specifically the CAC committee, uh, which has been great in, uh, in checking off on all the purchases we've had to make. Those uh, are called lion suits. We bought, uh, I believe it was 30 of them when COVID hit and it cost us about $65,000 just to buy 30 of those suits right there. But our corrections officers are working eight hour days <laughs> wearing those suits, the masks and, uh, the, uh, the gloves in those quarantine cell blocks. So just a glimpse at uh, how we're using that equipment to protect our staff and continue operations. Good to go, Blair. Uh, we're very excited about our diversion programs. We have been running in the jail that we brought in about a year and a half ago, two years ago. Uh, we, began, we began to turn them to the outside. So we're holding classes in the community, uh, forklift, OSHA certification with a job fair at the end of it, guaranteeing that if these people that are coming to the class don't have a job, that we connect them to one as they walk out of the class. So we've held six classes so far. We've sold out pretty much every single one. It's a mix of uh, formerly uh, or released former detainees and members of the public that are signing up to take these classes. Uh, this is just on our mission of community engagement and showing that public safety law enforcement is not an antagonistic member of the community, but a supportive member of the community by providing services and uh, resources. We also have a job board and a resource board now on the front page of canesheriff.com. Citizens can go here and uh, get connected to employment, background friendly, all of our employers are, and other community resources like childcare, uh, transportation are listed there uh, to, to link people to new opportunities. So if you know anybody that needs opportunities, jobs, uh, could use any of these resources, please point them to the front page of our website and our Facebook page. I'm trying to be as aggressive as possible in marketing this. Next one, please, Blair. Electronic monitoring continues to grow. We're up to 40 people as of today. Uh, remember, court services, when it was run under them, was about double that. Uh, at least for normal operations. So with our new wonderful state's attorney, we're really hoping for collaborative uh, participation and getting a lot of pretrial folks uh, onto 
uh, the electronic monitoring, which reduces our jail population. I'll show you an example of uh, how well we came in under budget this year. And this was a big part of how we were able to do that uh, by keeping people out of our facility. And of course, our diversion team I just spoke about is working uh, in lock sync with our electronic monitoring team to make sure as people go out on the bracelets that they do have uh, employment opportunities, they are going to work and they're not just sitting at home and potentially reoffending. Good to go back. So we do have some new crime trends. You heard State's Attorney Moster discuss uh, the increase in domestic batteries, uh, child abuse concerns, and you've perhaps seen on the 10 o'clock news all of the carjackings in Chicago. Well, that is spreading west. So what happens in the city is uh, people are targeted with these high-end vehicles who also have very fast high-end vehicles uh, are getting stolen in the city and these crews are coming out here late at night uh, to the central Kane County area, Mill Creek, uh, unincorporated St. Charles, the municipalities are also getting hit with this type of crime. But uh, I just want to point out, you can't really see it that well in that picture. And Blair, if you want to go to the next prompt and click on that link, this is a ring video camera of one of these crews and how they operate. And hopefully we can see what the gentleman has in his hand. You know what? Give us a sec. I don't know why it's uh, blocking the screen. Let me bring it up on the other computer. So usually these people are non-confrontational so far. The gentleman in this video, if we're able to get it to play, you can see it in the picture. I circled it there. If you can see it that close. He's carrying a, uh, appears to be a Glock handgun with an extended magazine. And uh, again, this is in unincorporated rural St. Charles. Uh, middle to upper class homes. The gentleman in that video opened his garage door as that guy was in his driveway uh, checking his car handles. Fortunately, he just turned around and ran. As the gentleman came out, we had another instance in Mill Creek uh, last week where one of our deputies, is it gonna play? Okay, here we go. I'll let the video say it all. Yeah, I wish we could widen that out. You see in his right hand, or maybe it's his left hand there, he does switch. Got a large handgun. Homeowner opens the door and he runs away, fortunately. We had another incident in Mill Creek a week ago, same MO as we call it, uh, where one of our deputies did spot one of these crews trying car doors. One of the uh, offenders ran back to the car, jumped in the Audi, a brand new Audi, and uh, led the deputy on a very high speed chase down Fabian Parkway all the way to 88 where they proceeded east back into the city. Our deputy terminated the pursuit due to speeds, simply not safe for him, which I approve of. So we're building in extra patrol details overnight. I'll be participating in those extra patrol details myself even as this uh, public safety concern is alarming, both uh, the, the speeds at which they travel, the people that they're uh, victimizing and the fact that they're walking around with guns in their hands in our community. So um, we're looking forward to eliminating this issue. Blair, you can flip ahead. <laughs> and of course, Illinois Department of Employment Security scams is another highlight in our public safety division. We're taking anywhere from five to ten days from victims that are uh, having their financial information uh, scammed, claiming to be IDES. So uh, just an unfortunate weight on our division, our public safety division. Larry, you can go to the next one, please. Uh, so yeah, we continue to support the health department um, in all of the COVID preparation, receiving all of the PPE from the state, disseminating it at all, disseminating it all and uh, preparing to receive the vaccine. Uh, we're expected to receive the freezers for it sometime within the week. Uh, we're positioning the Sally Port at the jail as a two lane drive through uh, initially for the first responder uh, delivery and then hopefully for public delivery when that fully opens up. So just another example of our collaboration with the, uh, the health department in that regard. Go to the next one. And 
So I brought two guests with me. I do like to uh, turn our office inside out. We, again, pointing to State's Attorney Monster's examples of what we're facing in the community with domestic battery, uh, child crimes. Uh, we've added an uh, exciting new team. I keep using the word exciting. That's my word this week. Uh, at the Sheriff's Office, a special, special victims team that will be working in the Investigations Division. Sergeant Brandon McInnes, uh, go ahead and stand up, Brandon. So he'll be leading that team. He'll have two and a half deputies or detectives underneath him. That uh, half a deputy is going to be shared with our general assignment investigations. And also excited to introduce our new social worker, the first of her kind at the sheriff's office, Nicole Krupp. So Nicole will be working very closely with Brandon's group and the rest of our patrol division. So she's been with us for about two and a half weeks now, and she's getting cases thrown at her left and right. So welcome aboard, Nicole, and good luck, Brandon. Thank you. One more slide. We'll be working on our annual report as well. Uh, our international drug efforts will be highlighted in that. So our, our team that works in that realm has had some really impressive statistics this year. I've been doing uh, good at pulling these up and reporting them to the public. But just to highlight, in 2020, they've affected 30 arrests on uh, international uh, narcotic smugglers that are operating in the region. They seized 4.6 million in drug proceeds, 2,200 pounds of marijuana, 240 pounds of cocaine, 39 pounds of fentanyl, nine pounds of heroin, 16 assault weapons and handguns, and seized eight vehicles used in that trafficking. So we're really excited to highlight that. I This was my forte at the sheriff's office when I was a deputy, and I didn't even come close to those kind of numbers. Um, so they're doing some incredible work out there. Our finance reports are of course on record. <clears throat> um, you look at the end of the fiscal year and you add up all the numbers on paper, we're 2.1 million under budget uh, as the end of November closed. A big chunk of that was about 1.2 million out of our corrections division, uh, both with our retirement benefit offer that we ran uh, in mid 2020, created a great deal of savings, our reduced jail population and EHM all contributed to uh, how far we came in under. Of course, we don't know where our final numbers <coughs> And uh, we still will have some more payroll, uh, payroll payouts uh, through January and uh, some additional invoices to pay. We expect to come in right around 700000 under budget uh, as uh, FY21 or FY20 comes to an end. And Blair, I think that's it, and we can move on to our resolution. Okay, thank you. Um, may I have a motion um, and a second to discuss uh, the resolution? Uh, made by Mr. Leonard, seconded by Mr. Sanchez. Um, go ahead, Sheriff. Sure. So this is the uh, what we call the JAG grant that is shared, the uh, Memorial Justice Assistance Grant that is shared between the City of Aurora and City of Elgin. And this resolution is simply a mechanism to accept the funding. All right. Do we have any questions? Discussion? No. Oh, I just call the roll. Brown. Yes. Gums. Yes. Leonard. Yes. Sanchez? Yes. Davis? Davis, yes. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, um, our next item on the agenda is from our judiciary and courts. Mr. Good morning. Naughton. For those of you that don't know me, my name is Doug Naughton. I'm the court administrator. Uh, judge Hall sends his regrets, our chief judge. He's currently on a Zoom call with the Illinois Supreme Court and all the chief judges uh, in the state. This is their check-in day to find out what's going on. Uh, our monthly report essentially is, boy, that's loud, is uh, effective December 1, the courts went fully remote. Now, if you recall back in March, we shut down, there was no court, people weren't allowed in. That's not happening right now. We have closed down some of the facilities to prevent public from going in, but if you had a court case, we're going to do it remotely through Zoom. So what we've done is in Aurora, in Elgin, in St. Charles Branch Court, and at the courthouse, we have staff and interpreters there for the non-English speaking people to tell them what's going on and hand them out directions, if they don't already have it, about how to use their phones or whatever to uh, join the court hearings by Zoom. <laughs> We still do allow people to come in for court in emergency situations. Now, what the state's attorneys and stuff were talking about with the juvenile abuse and neglect, some of that still is in person, simply because when you have a juvenile hearing like 
uh, abuse and neglect, you could have six, seven, eight uh, different bodies. So not only do we allow that for juvenile abuse and neglect, but also for orders of protection and emergency hearings, temporary restraining orders and things like that. So if you want, you can go to our website, 16thjudicialcircuit.gov, I think, or org, and you can watch the court in session. Uh, it, we have a live streaming page. It's on YouTube, so you can watch all the criminal proceedings going on, all right? Um, one of the things we're going to be coming back, and I don't know if we're going to be bringing it to this committee or the finance committee or directly to uh, exact, is we've been working with buildings and grounds about continuing the special cleaning contracts we have. Once this, I guess, slowdown or not our remote hearing session ends, we'd like to have the special cleaning crews to come in and wipe down all the highly touchable areas. Uh, we'd like to keep them in here. They, their contract will end at the end of December simply because they're being paid for by CARES Act money. We'd like to continue that service at least for six months. It does help the public remain calm, especially the people we bring in for jury duty. Uh, normally on, on a week, even during the, the uh, pandemic, we're bringing in 50, 60 people for jury duty. We're still doing... Uh, felony and misdemeanor trials. 12 men for the criminal felony, mostly six for the domestic violence DUI type cases. And having those people wipe down all the tubs is a great thing. So at some point in time, we're going to come back to you. We're working with Chris Allen to come up with the contracts. I'm not sure which committee we're going to go to, but I at least want to give you a heads up. If somebody's going to see it soon, okay? Now, if I can, can we go to our resolution, please? Yes, please go ahead. Okay. Um, so let's um, let's make a motion and a second first for the um, authorizing contracts for interpreter services. Yes. Uh, moved by Mr. Leonard, second by Mr. Sanchez. Go ahead. Okay. At this time, I'd like to introduce Andrea O'Brien. She's our deputy court administrator. She will take you through the resolution. Morning. Yeah, it's on. Yeah. Morning, Andrew O'Brien, Deputy Court Administrator. Uh, we have a resolution before you. Now, the one that we submitted in your packet for contracting for interpreter services uh, is actually incorrect. Uh, we, we need to amend that. I have passed out to the members here physically um, an updated copy. Uh, we erroneously included a vendor that we do not plan to contract with. So uh, we've made that adjustment, and I'd be happy to email it. If it didn't work, uh, if Blair couldn't do that after the meeting. Mm -hmm. uh, but th these are contracted interpreters. The, the contract ran out November 30th, so we just need to contract again with some new vendors. Um, it's already budgeted for, so we're just asking that it be authorized. Right. Um, can, I, can you let me know which vendors were sure. removed from the current um, resolution? Okay, so uh, the one that was removed is um, Wellspring Interpreting. Mm -hmm. So it should be with Shirley Waking and okay. then approved AOIC interpreting services. Okay, great. Um, is there any discussion on the motion? Do we need to make a motion to amend? Yes. Yes. I'll, I'll make the motion to amend as, as, uh, as stated. Okay. Mm -hmm. A motion by Mr. Sanchez to amend and second by Mr. Leonard. Any questions on the amendment? Okay, so let's go ahead and roll call for the amendment on the requested change. 
Brown? Yes. Gums? Gums, yes. Leonard? Yes. Sanchez? Yes. Davis? Davis, yes. Thank you. Okay, so um, if I can have a, is there any discussion on the amendment and the motion as amended? None? Okay, so I can have a uh, roll call on the motion as amended, please. Yes. Gums? Gums, yes. Leonard? Yes. Sanchez? Yes. Davis? Davis, yes. Okay, great. Thank you. Yeah. And this will move on to finance. Thank you. Okay, and now we have uh, court services. Ms. Ost, good, good morning. morning. Thank you. So the pandemic, as we all know through the news, has been really hard on local businesses. It's also been very hard on social service agencies. Um, and so the, the first resolution, I wanna talk about it just for a moment before we get there, which is that, um, as you all know, we have a lot of sex offenders on probation caseload and we work really hard on something called a containment model. So um, in order, there's been a lot of research that shows that if you effectively work with containing people who have sexually motivated offenses, it is possible to decrease the recidivism rate and keep the public safe, as well as particularly for younger people like adolescents, we can actually extinguish that behavior within themselves and within that their drive to do those sexually motivated um, offenses. So we use something called the containment model, which includes doing polygraphs, includes going intensive treatment and uh, probation. We go into their homes, we do searches, we engage with the family, we actually do um, safety plans with the family to monitor the adolescent's behavior and keep track of them. So with the pandemic, we haven't been able to do those searches because we're not going into the homes per se. And as KaneCon knows, um, once the virus is in the community, a lot of our um, residents have been affected. And so we just wanna keep everyone safe by not inadvertently being a vector for the transmission ourselves. Having said that, our primary um, service provider for the treatment, which has really picked up the slack, was One Hope United. They're no longer able to provide services in our area. They've withdrawn a lot of their suburban offices. The closest office to us now is Gurney. That's just not effective for a containment model. So we were just notified um, about 30 days ago that they're no longer offering services. There aren't a lot of service providers that provide this in our area. However, we were able to locate one. Um, and so we have reached out to them and talked to them. And by the way, uh, there are some service providers in our area, but not, a, not one with the capacity to pick up a, a big full containment model caseload like what we need here. And so we were able to identify one. We um, had a series of meetings and they are able, they have hired people actually from this agency that is no longer providing services and then brought them into their own agency. So I'm very hopeful that we could form a new collaboration, uh, collaboration because they already know a lot of the same clients and we could do a warm handoff. Um, and so that is the nature of the first resolution that I'm bringing in front of you. Oh, and by the way, this is paid for entirely out of probation fees. There's no impact on the general fund. Uh, may I have a motion and a second uh, for the resolution of the notification of sex offender treatment made by Mr. Leonard, second by Mr. Sanchez. Any discussion on the resolution? Okay. Okay. Brown? Yes. Gums? Gums, yes. Leonard? Yes. Sanchez? Yes. Davis? Davis, yes. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. For my second resolution, um, it is for um, authorizing extension of adult drug court um, contracts. As you know, we recently obtained another federal grant, which I'm super excited about. Um, this federal grant will be able to continue to provide um, intensive treatment for our drug court participants here in Kane County with local Kane County service providers. Um, and so again, there is no impact at all on the general fund for this. We're paying for this exclusively out of the grant funds. And so I'm looking for your support on that. Thank you, Mayor. Davis moves. Mr. Davis, second by Mr. Leonard. Any questions or discussion on the resolution? Okay, please call the roll. Yes. Gums? Gums, yes. Leonard? Yes. Sanchez? Yes. Davis? Davis, yes. 
Thank you. Thank you, Mrs. Oss. I have nothing else to report unless you have any questions for me. No, I think. Thank you very much. Thank you. Okay, now our next item is the Juvenile Justice Center. Mr. Davis. Good morning. I'm Mike Davis. Um, I'm the superintendent of the, at the Juvenile Justice Center. I don't have a whole lot this morning. Our monthly report is on file. Um, for those of you that are unfamiliar with our building, uh, we contract with seven other counties to provide juvenile detention services. So our monthly financial report is the per diem that we charge those counties. So we were down slightly this year compared to last year. It was not unexpected. Uh, we limited intakes due to the pandemic. And uh, we also had an outbreak, a small outbreak in August where we had to uh, divert admissions for four to six weeks. So um, our totals for this year are pretty similar to what they were in 2018, uh, the year that we had to suspend admissions due to a strike. Uh, aside from that, we've fared pretty well this year um, with the pandemic. Um, over the Since March, we've had five kids that tested positive and eight staff members. Um, I'm sorry. We currently don't have um, any positive cases. Uh, obviously, like every other business and agency, we have a few people out on quarantine um, most days. And um, we're constantly doing interviews because it's been extremely difficult uh, to hire and especially retain people. Uh, as I've mentioned last week, uh, working in detention is a, is, is a difficult job and especially during a pandemic. So um, we had two more uh, people resign recently. I'm happy that they were, um, that they were staying in the county. Um, they were hired by the Sheriff's Department to work in the jail. Um, you're welcome. Um, and um, so um, we, we did some interviews this week and we continue to uh, push forward there. But aside from that, uh, I don't have a whole lot to, else today, unless anyone has any questions. Thank you, Mr. Davis. Any questions? Okay, thank you so much. Okay, so let's move along to our Kane, uh, Kane Com, uh, Ms. Guthrie. Yes, good morning. good morning. My name is Michelle Guthrie. I am the director of Kane Com. And just a little background, we are one of the 911 centers in Kane County. Uh, we dispatch for nine police agencies and seven fire departments. Our largest subscribing agency is the Kane County Sheriff's Office. We also handle some after hours answering um, of the health department phone calls. When the health department is not staffed, we those calls are fielded by our telecommunicators after hours. Um, as the sheriff detailed in his report, it's been a very busy month. Um, it, you know, calls that the deputies respond to are answered by our agency and dispatched by our telecommunicators, um, which is reflected in our report. Um, each month we do include an activities report, a daily call for service report. And that daily call for service report is really the statistics of our subscribing agencies and the activities that they respond to. The phone call report that's included each month is the activity by, um, by our staff as well. Um, so we may not always create a call for service for a phone call that KingCom receives, um, but we do take in a lot of phone calls each month. Um, I believe this month it's close to 11,800. <clears throat> for our report, the biggest project that we're working on right now is that radio project. Um, I will have a more thorough report of that radio project uh, next month with some pictures as well. Right now, it's a lot of boxes as it's all being stored within KaneCom. And we are working with the Sheriff's Office to configure programming of our new radio councils, as well as the programming of the radio portables. Um, and those portables will go to the Sheriff's Department, as well as a few for subscribing agencies um, and uh, fire departments as well. Um. Other than that, our other big project right now is the hiring of our new telecommunicators. So we did hire two new telecommunicators in November. The process of training new telecommunicators takes about six to nine months. That is a mix of a classroom style training um, as well as hands-on application where they are partnered with their training officer or training telecommunicator before they can ever answer any calls on their own. Um, so they are a couple weeks in. I'm pleased to say that they're already answering almost all non-emergency calls and they're moving on to 911 calls as well. So their training is going very well. We also have somebody waiting to be hired. Um, when we have a trainer available, then they will be brought aboard. I believe that is um, the summary of my report this month. I'm happy to answer any questions you might have. Thank you. Any questions for Ms. Gunthry? Okay. All right. Thank you so much. Thank you. Okay, now we have uh, Merit Commission. Mr. Aziz? 
Hi there. Good morning. My name is Todd Zeese. I'm the vice chairman for the uh, Kane County Merit Commission. For those of you who don't know, the Merit Commission is a three-person board um, that our basis is we do the hiring uh, of the corrections officers and the deputies throughout Kane County. Uh, so our board, we get together and we do the interview process and the testing uh, and, uh, and the such and give the information to our sheriff. As of right now, the corrections office uh, for our September 2020 eligibility list uh, is exhausted and it was exhausted in October. Um, and we are gonna be testing for corrections officer, officers on December 14th. Uh, interviews are gonna be beginning on December 15th. That's probably gonna take about a week and a half or so. Uh, applications for lateral transfers uh, are now gonna be accepted year round. This is something that's very handy for us because we're able to utilize people coming from other departments that have education and it's easy. Uh, it's a, a good fix for us. Um, and uh, if you don't have any further questions, uh, or if you have any questions, I can take them from you right now. Any questions for Mr. Zies or the Merit Commission? No? Okay. Thank you so much. Okay. Thank you. All right. So we will move along to our circuit clerk, Ms. Barrero. Is she online? Yes, I am. Good morning, everyone. Good morning. I'm Teresa Barrero. I'm the uh, elected circuit clerk. Many of you have known me for the past eight years as a county board member. It's very weird not voting on things, um, chairman, as we go along, uh, stepping into this new role. But I would like to just add that um, a report is in your packets. And if you have any questions, please um, let me know. We're going to be changing up this report. So it will, it will, um, be a little more streamlined for everyone with a little more explanation going forward. And yes, um, Sheriff Hayne, I do need to work on my PowerPoints also. Okay, let's see. The next thing I would like to add a few things. We distributed our work from home equipment uh, when the clerks were all sworn in in groups of 10. That went extremely well due to the staff um, and the procedures that we set up so that we could keep everybody social distancing and still uh, get them all everything they need with their new IDs and that going forward. Um, the next uh, I would like to talk about is collections. As you all know, this has been a bane um, in my side for a while now, but I've looked at the collections and for the month of October, 279 cases were sent to Harrison Harris. They're our agency that, that are contracted for the handling of our collections. Um, the total dollars that the county has received in the month of October was $221,836.43. Um, now the original, just, just to give you a little idea of what, what the difference in some of this is and what actually goes to the county and what goes out to other agencies that the, per, that the file is being, um, uh, sent to collections on. The original amount was $543,744.50. So the county got $221,836 out of that. That's just a, a little uh, snapshot to let you know a little bit of the difference there. I have a monthly gross collections received, um, monthly cases sent, total assessment for cases sent to collections report. If any of you would like, I will have one sent to you. Um, we are working on breaking that down to see what actually the county keeps after all of this, um, but that is our main goal uh, due to revenue being down over 50%. We were bringing in about $40,000, let's just say average throughout the county a day. Now we're, we're just a little over 20,000 a day. So that's just a little bit to let you know what 2021 will be going forward. Um, it, it looks pretty bleak, but financially, but we're all working on other avenues to try and collect um, uh, monies from files that are, are fines and fees that um, are due to us. It's an it's a uphill battle because of all the unemployment and that right now going on throughout the state of Illinois and the county. So it's, it's just a 
one foot in front of the other. I'm sure you're all familiar with, um, we're all going through the same thing in every, every uh, department throughout the county. But for the month of December, we have one out uh, with COVID. Um, for, we, we made sure that we broke our staff down to 50%. So we have 47 of 97 staff working from home. Three have been quarantined or isolated and working from home due to family members that have tested positive. So I think we're doing really good as far as our COVID um, stats. Everybody fills out a Google sheet before they even start. Uh, we do take our temperature still. So everything is, we're doing everything we can, cleaning surfaces to minimize the spread throughout the office. And I think the staff has done phenomenal in uh, working with each other in order to isolate any, any incidents. Now on a happier note, the staff has been in uh, the Christmas spirit and has been collecting toys for tots. We are up to our third box. So that is so cool to see. We are also collecting socks for the needy and that box is pretty full. And we also are asking everyone to, um, if they want, if they would like to participate, uh, donate 10 Christmas cards to um, our supply that we are going to donate to local nursing homes. A lot of uh, individuals in nursing homes do not even get a Christmas card from anyone. So I thought this was a great idea that um, our Chief of Operations, Karen Herwick, came up with and, and her staff. And I think that's a phenomenal idea. And it gets everybody kind of in the Christmas spirit. They just sign their name and that they're from the circuit clerk's office and uh, we will distribute them. So that's really cool. So that's my report for today. If you have any questions, um, please let me know. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Any questions for our circuit clerk? How, how does she say her last name again? I've heard so many versions. <laughs> We can practice that, Mr. Davis. Yes, please practice that. Thank you. <laughs> Will do. Okay, thank you. Okay, uh, next uh, is our public defender. Thank you. Good morning. Um, my name is Rochelle Clonet. For those of you who don't know me, I am the public defender. Um, I want to wel echo everyone's welcome to the new members, and I look forward to working with all of you. Um, it, our report is attached. I just have a couple of things to add to that. Our attorneys, as of November 30th, as with the whole county, are uh, fully remote. Um, so they are working from home. I will say that fully remote versus the shutdown has gone much easier, much smoother. Um, the attorneys are a lot less anxious this time. And I think that is a credit to all of the great technology that IT has afforded to us and that this county has afforded to us to be able to continue to do our job and to do it pretty much seamlessly from home. We do still have the issue of uh, maintaining contact with our clients from home using uh, personal numbers to do that. But we have, uh, the attorneys have worked very hard to be innovative and come up with ways to be able to do that without giving out their own personal phone numbers. Um, they continue to work very, very hard to try in this environment to move their cases forward. Um, we have worked with the state's attorney's office and with Ms. Mosser we are working with now to try to reduce those numbers to get back to some normal levels of case numbers. Um, I would echo Ms. Mosser's comments in that I think at this time, the busiest courtroom that we have too is the abuse and neglect courtroom. Um, our numbers have continued to rise significantly in that courtroom. We um, only have one attorney assigned to that courtroom in hand. That has been the case for a number of years. Luckily for us, um, that attorney had civil experience. He has done a phenomenal job there. Unfortunately, um, he is going to be retiring in January. Uh, so that is a big hit for our office because he did such an excellent job there and had such a good grasp on that area of the law and working with his clients there. So I am working now to fill that position and hopefully that will be a very seamless transition and uh, will not disrupt what goes on in that courtroom. I just finally wanna point out that um, I, I have to say, and this kind of goes back to the remote, 
there is not a day that goes by that I don't think I hear from an attorney or that I see myself as to how grateful we are to be a part of this county um, because I can tell you our interactions with other counties where we have clients in custody and the ability to communicate with those those clients in outside counties is very, very difficult because they don't have near the technology or the progress that we have made. So um, we are all very grateful to be a part of this county that we can maintain such good contact with all of our clients. Thank you. Thank you. Any questions for our public defender? Okay, thank you so much. Uh, moving on, is our coroner here or is there a report? I am. Okay, welcome. Thank you. Um, I first want to, uh, you know, welcome everybody again. Um, I want to mirror the sheriff's opening remarks. They were quite eloquent. Nice job, Ron. Um, thanking, uh, I want to thank uh, Mr. Leonard for being the, uh, the chair. And, you know, we worked well together uh, with everything. Um, we are a collaborative committee, um, very nonpartisan. We were, we, you know, we're public servants. And uh, I'm just very thankful um, to, to, have the opportunity again uh, for the next four years to be able to serve in this capacity. Um, you know, as well as Mr. Leonard, um, you've got Mr. Shepro, who's, who's also on the committee. Um, he has probably the second most amount of knowledge um, in the coroner's office as he has spent hours studying many of the operations um, as my financial advisor in the first four years of, um, of my tenure as I was justifying my existence. And I'll just stop there. Um, the, um, some of the other things, um, uh, as far as feedback, um, I would absolutely welcome and encourage, and I will have a PowerPoint next, uh, next month, uh, to kind of, uh, go over some stuff. Um, but I, I really, really would like some feedback from you, the committee, uh, as far as what type of information that you would like to see. Um, and again, I always try to be concise, um, you know, with, with the material, um, but if, you know, if I can get some feedback from you guys, and some of you have been here a while, some of you that are brand new, uh, I would really appreciate that because sometimes we kind of get lost in the weeds when it comes to doing our job every day. We, we assume everybody knows uh, everything of, of what we do. And, and uh, as the old saying goes, there is no dumb question. And uh, we would like to, I'd like to be able to feel that people can ask whatever question they feel that they need to get their questions answered. So um, so yeah, next month I'll, I'll be bringing forth a PowerPoint, um, uh, detailing our operations, budgets, and whatever requests, uh, you all have, uh, between now and then, um, for next month, I will try to answer any questions, uh, via that way. Um, we are uh, in the Christmas season, um, as you recall, um, last year and the year before we did an event called Christmas Cheer, and that was where on Christmas morning, we actually, uh, we're able to give some meals to the people who, uh, who, who are, who are in need of that. So, um, you know, my, uh, myself and, and my family and, uh, several of my employees have been involved with Christmas cheer for the last two years, and I had hoped to make it an annual thing. However, this year we are still going to have Christmas cheer, um, as a word. However, as an event, uh, we will not be able to do that. It has been postponed due to COVID. So we're, we're kind of all sad about that another victim of COVID. So, um, and also next month, I will bring forth the, the, the budget adjustment talked about at the beginning by Erica. Um, so um, unfortunately, uh, looking at our numbers, and I can tell you this, uh, you know, like many of the other um, offices and, and departments out there is that we, it, it, we can't just close like today, but, you know, there are several uh, up death investigations and in that, that, that takes six, eight, 10 weeks to finish. But I can tell you this for certainty is that we are up over 600 deaths this year. Um, basically, we are approaching 4,000 deaths. So it's uh, for a county, um, you know, we have been averaging about 30, between 3,000 and 3,300 deaths a year. Um, so we are significantly up this year and only about 450 of those at, at this point are, are COVID related. So there are other, obviously, forms of death that are up. Um, and I will have a detailed um, you know, I will present that detailed um, next month. Moving on to the building, uh, we're very, very excited about the building. Um, and if any of you have not seen our current facility, it might be, uh, uh, and, and you feel safe to do so, might want to stop by. 
Uh, we spray daily um, and have air scrubbers. So I think it'll give you a, a, a new appreciation when you walk through the new facility and, and see uh, where we're doing business right now. Um, uh, there's one also with the building, um, Ms. Ost from uh, the juvenile uh, detention had brought something up to me that I, I was not aware of, um, but I think it's very, very important is that there's a berm uh, between the uh, the juvenile and, and us, um, uh, but I guess it's not tall enough. So we, we've been in discussion, maybe working with the forest preserve or something to plant some trees, because there is a need for sight and sound separation when it comes to the juveniles as they're outside playing and whatnot. So um, I'm very happy to work with her and the committee and whoever else uh, to make sure that that happens. Um, getting back to COVID, our favorite uh, topic of the day. Um, we have had our first employee uh, test positive. So I find it, uh, to me, it, it's pretty remarkable. Um, and I, I attribute it to the diligence of my staff and my chief, especially the fact that we've only had one so far. Um, and so that's, a, unfortunately, it's somebody on midnight. So uh, Coroner Russell may be working midnight. So we would do whatever we need to do to, uh, to, make it, to make the office function and work. Um, as far as the list goes, the, def, uh, the list of the decedents, uh, we, are, we have been scrubbing that list in a sense that, you know, the, the, the list kind of morphs and changes because uh, a COVID death may come in as a COVID death. And then, you know, six, eight weeks later, uh, the test results or whatever may come back and it may, may change. Maybe, maybe they weren't positive because we actually do test the students who have not been tested. Um, so therefore, um, you know, a, 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 the death that comes in as a, as a COVID death may indeed change. Um, so we have to scrub that list and make sure that it's accurate. So we have been diligent with, with that. I'm also working with a, uh, a scientist. Um, we're trying to get a grant funded um, um, type of uh, yeah, study basically on um, we're going to we're going to try to test everybody that comes through. And, uh, of course, we want to make sure all that is grant funded um, um, to, to kind of give us to help our CDC and our state and whoever else. And hopefully, you know, we're, we're looked at as I know that we're looked at as a leader you know, across the country, um, the office. So I want to be able to uh, contribute and hopefully help uh, study this animal that we're dealing with. Um, so as far as the, uh, the, uh, the operations, I'd also like to invite all of you for uh, a ride along uh, or a tour, depending on how, you know, if you feel safe enough to do so. Uh, we are very uh, clean. <laughs> we are very conscientious to make sure that we stay um, you know, uh, disease free with the, um, the COVID situation. So we have plenty of N95 masks and whatnot. So if you feel, um, that you are safe enough and want to, uh, we would very much, uh, like for you to come and, uh, experience, uh, at least on a small note, what it is that we do. Um, um, like Mr. Sanchez, Mr. Caius, um, they've all been on ride alongs in the, in the past. Um, and you also have Mr. Davis, who is a former JPS chair that um, can kind of give you an idea as far as because we, we, we do much more than just go to a scene and pick up a body and, um, you know, determine cause and manner. We we uh, there's a, a very large investigation that occurs, you know, with with a death to make sure that it's done right. There's a lot of things writing on that, uh, making sure that, you know, if it's an accidental death, that it's an accidental death. And if it's not, then it's not. But. You know, there are not only um, criminal uh, aspects to that, but there are also some civil aspects to that, um, which, again, I will detail in the PowerPoint uh, next month. So that's all that I have for now. Uh, if anybody has any questions. Thank you, Mr. Gums, I have a quick question. Go ahead, Ms. Gums. Uh, Mr. Russell, um, in your report next month, I you said there's no such thing as a dumb question. I'm holding you to it. When a... Um, <laughs> when a COVID positive case comes in and then it is redetermined as non-positive, can you um, detail that out as to how that happens? Sure. Sure. Yeah. Uh, we, you know, we will get stay at home deaths. If they're in the hospital, mo more than likely they have been tested and obviously they know that they're positive and whatnot, but if it's a home death and uh, say some friends or family say, you know what, he, he or she had some, signs uh, of, uh, you know, having the disease, um, 
then we have to actually test them. And we, we do that. We have um, test kits that we, we test the decedent in the home. Uh, we process it as a COVID death because, you know, obviously there's safety involved there. Um, and then it may change. It may come back as negative. Um, so depending on the circumstance, again, the circumstances, uh, you know, there, there's a myriad, uh, you know, a tremendous amount of different circumstances. Not every, not every death is the same. So, um, you know, so we, we may have to look at that death certificate when it comes in. Um, and if it's, if it's our, um, um, it may not be from COVID. They may have died from something else, and if they're not, and if they're not um, positive, we, we obviously know they couldn't have died from COVID if they're not positive. But there may be other circumstances that would indicate, um, you know, that they didn't die from COVID. So we we want to make sure that the lists are accurate. I know there's been a lot of, um, uh, you know, how, you know, a lot of different things being said out there about. Uh, you know, cooking of numbers and that kind of thing. And I, I just, to me, I, I want to make sure that we are accurate. And so sometimes, you know, by putting in the extra effort and uh, scrubbing this list, we look at the actual death certificates. So those are performed. There's only two people who can sign the death certificate. It's a doctor, a licensed uh, doctor, or me, the coroner. So um, many of these death certificates are signed by doctors. So we have to take their word for it. They know their profession. So if they put on the death certificate that it's not a COVID death and I, you know, I, I can't, I mean, I could change it, but I wouldn't, there's no reason for me to do that. So um, that's what I mean by scrubbing the list. Very good. And thank you for your answer. Thank you. Any further questions or um, any requests for Mr. Russell at this moment? No. Okay. Thank you. Okay, um, our next item, um, we don't have executive session, so um, our next item would be to um, a motion to place the reports on file. Made by Mr. Leonard, second by Mr. Brown. Um, may I have a roll call, please? Brown? Yes. Gums? Gums, yes. Leonard? Yes. Sanchez? Yes. Davis? Davis, yes. Thank you. Thank you. And before we make a motion to adjourn, I just wanted to thank everybody. And I, um, I want to extend my gratitude um, to all of um, our employees that are um, especially here on the front line and our, our essential workers. Um, we're going into this holiday season and many of you um, are sacrificing time with family and we'll be celebrating Christmas um, taking care of our residents. So I just want to thank you and I hope that um, uh, you pass that along to the rest of our employees. Um, anybody else have anything to add? No, okay, then may I have a motion to adjourn? Made by Mr. Sanchez, second by Mr. Brown. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Thank you. We'll see you all next month. Thank you. Thank you.